Well, hello, God bless you. Bishop Patrick L. Wooden Sr. here, and I pray that you're having a wonderful day. I pray that you're blessed of the Lord and highly favored and walking in the things of God. Now, my friends, I have a few things I want to say to you today, and I want to start by saying a great big thank you to everyone uh, how you responded to my 37th pastoral anniversary. God has been so good to me. He's watched over me. He's watched over my wife and my family. He's watched over and blessed the upper room ministry. God has blessed us and done wonderful things these 37 years. And among the blessings that the God of the Bible has given me, my friends, the God of the Bible has given me you. Thank you for the way you pray for this preacher. Thank you for every monetary gift that you sent. And somebody said, well, preacher, I, I wasn't able to send what I would like or to send anything at all, but I sent up a prayer. Well, you've done enough because let me tell you something, nothing works like prayer. And I want to say to you, continue to pray for this preacher, continue to stand by me, continue to lift us up, and yes, continue to support this ministry, this kind of preaching, because I'm telling you that uh, we're going to continue to stand and preach the word of God. And, and, and listen, people are asking me, I get this question all the time, man of God, can we count on you to stand on God's word and stand on God's truth no matter what? Well, God's word and God's truth, that's the hill that I've decided to die on. I don't believe that there's anything else on earth as important as God's truth. The devil has his lies. The world has their philosophies. There are all kinds of things that are coming against uh, God's truth. There are lower truths. There are lower teachings, but my friends, there is such a thing as overarching truth and the overarching arching truth is God's truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And everyone worth their salt is going to stand on God's truth. And if you don't stand on God's truth, my friends, I want you to know whatever you're standing on is sinking sand. So thank you for your support. Thank you for your prayers. If you saw the anniversary service, you saw for yourself that it was a fantastic service. We had a ball. The preachers did preach. The singers did sing. The musicians did play. The Those who gave tributes, they were on point. So many wonderful things. The committee did a tremendous job. The members of the upper room, you're the best. You, you stood by me. I thank you so much. And our friends from around this, this country, our friends who stream and watch, you too made this so special. And this preacher, on the behalf of me and my, my wife, we I want to say thank you so much. And now we're in year 38. What will God do? What will God say? What role will we play uh, in Christ this year? But I tell you this, I don't know what will uh, come to pass, but other than this, I know whatever happens, I'm staying with the Bible. Whatever happens, I'm staying with sanctification, and I'm going to stay with God's truth and preach the word of the Lord and believe God and trust God for the rest. Now, now that's an interesting segue into a concern that I do have. Uh, and my concern is based on my understanding of how God deals with the world and the universe and all that he has made. My friends, I am not a deist. I do not believe that God made everything and then left it. I don't believe that God wound everything up and, and, and took the universe and, 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 and threw it out there and said to the universe, uh, you're on your own. Uh, do what you will. Whatever happens, just happens. It'll, it'll be luck, chance, this or that. No, I believe uh, that God made everything and that he rules it even today. 
that he intervenes, that he is in charge. I believe that he knows the end from the beginning. I believe that the God of the Bible, he is the one who ultimately controls the weather. He controls nations. He controls uh, leaders of nations who do not even know him. I believe that the hand of the king, the heart of the king, the Bible says, is in the hand of the Lord. I believe that despots around the world who don't know Jesus are yet controlled by the Lord. I believe that God is able, as the Bible teaches, to send a breeze, to send a thought, to stir up the mind of a leader in a foreign country whose God is not the Lord. I believe that God is able to stir that man up, stir that leader up, and cause him to do God's bidding. And I do believe this, that uh, when the people of God turn their backs on the Lord, then we invite the wrath and the judgment of God. In this day and time where we all talk about God's love and he just, he just loves us and he loves us unconditionally and uh, there's nothing else to talk about except his love. Uh, that's not the God of the Bible. He does love us unconditionally. He loved us so much that he gave his son. But my friends, he's also a God of judgment, a God of wrath. He's also a God who have given us uh, parameters, God have, who have given us uh, boundaries and rules and told us how uh, to serve him. And he's also a God who speaks to the consequences that we face when we fail to serve him. One of the things that have shaken me to the core, and I will not back down, I will not move away from it, I will speak to the sins of the nation and I will speak to the righteousness of the nation. And uh, I, I've said this, Brother Gareth, I've said it one time, I've said it a thousand times. No prophet, no priest, no man of God, no one who speaks for the Lord worth their salt ever ignores the defining issues of their day. God knows Dr. King did not ignore the defining issues of his era. God knows, hallelujah, Bishop Charles Harrison Mason was not negligent in dealing with the defining issues of his era. God bless the mighty Bonhoeffer who did not uh, de uh, neglect the, the, the defining issues of his, of his era. And I can go down the list of great preachers who spoke to the times in which they live. Well, my friends, I will not. Uh, make the mistake of being silent where God wants me to speak up and then speaking on things that have no eternal merit nor moment. The Bible speaks of what is called, things that are called the weightier matters of the law. As a matter of fact, this I wasn't even planning to show you this, but let me just read this to you. Something that Jesus said um, to the um, to the, to the Pharisees, Matthew's gospel, chapter 23 and verse uh, 23. He says, woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, comma, then he called them hypocrites. Again, read how it is constructed. Woe unto you, comma, scribes, Pharisees, comma, then he calls them hypocrites, exclamation point. So our Lord is speaking speaking with energy and fervor. He says, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and common, common, and look at this, have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Notice what the Lord speaks of here, weightier matters. Now he, he speaks to their adherents and their obedience and their willingness to pay the tithe. But then the Lord speaks of their, their, their neglecting other matters in the law and he called them weightier. Now I know some of you are members of a church uh, or you follow a preacher who will lead you to believe that the, the weightiest matters of the law is how much you give on Sunday or whether or not you're paying your tithe as, and as important as tithing and offerings are, and they are extremely important. 
But Jesus lets us know clearly that, that they're not the weightier matters of the law. What are the weightiest matters of the law? He says, judgment, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done and not left the others undone. Yes, continue to pay your tithe. Continue to tithe on every little thing that you have. Uh, but don't neglect judgment, justice. Don't neglect being merciful. Don't neglect our faith, what we believe, the Christian, the, the teachings, the doctrines of the faith. Some of us, we are going to pay every re report. We've never missed a national report. We've never missed a jurisdictional report. We've never missed a district report. We've never missed an official day. But when it comes to judgment, righteousness, obeying the doctrine, adhering in the weightier matters, in many, in many cases, many of us fall short. Now, one of the weightier and the weightiest matters of the law has to deal with the innocent. Innocence. Innocence. The people who are not guilty. Good people. The Bible says this concerning weightier matters and innocent people and good people. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter number 6 and verse 16, it says, these six things doth the Lord hate. Now, I would think anything that God hates is indeed a part of the weightier matters of the law. Yea, seven, all seven are an abomination. That these things are, uh, are, are wicked. They're, 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 they are a detestable, word abomination. They are detestable uh, unto him. What is detestable unto the Lord? Number one, a proud look. That is haughtiness in the eyes, the arrogance, those who walk in the, the state of holier than thou, a lying tongue. A hand, and look, look at this. Number three, he says, and hands that shed innocent blood. Hands that shed innocent blood. And he goes on and he speaks of a heart that divides wickedness, wicked imaginations, feet that uh, that be swift in, in running to mischief, a false lies, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth seeds of discord among the brethren. Now, I could talk to you about these all day, but with the little time that I have, I want to take a look at number three. And I'm not suggesting that they are listed in their, uh, 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 a list of being the most detestable. I'm just saying he did mention, thirdly, hands that shed innocent blood. That is murder. In our country today, we are, you see, let me rephrase this. Uh, uh, Gary, show them the, 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 the sign here. We, 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 you, you, we're seeing billboards. We're seeing things displayed where there are people who are blood thirsty. They are thirsty to shed innocent blood. Roe v. Wade was overturned. And when you listen to some, you would think that this was the worst thing that could ever happen. You would think that uh, it has eliminated abortion all over the country. Now, I'll be honest with you. I wish it had, but it did not. What it did was it simply, for those of you who said they, that they've gone too far, they simply took law that was bad law in the first place. The people never got a chance to chime in. The Supreme Court made that decision. It was bad law. It was set on bad precedents. And, uh, and it got overturned. And it, and, it, and it did away with a federal mandate for abortion and sent it back 
to the states where each state, the people in each state can decide. Now, I want to say to the people in each state, yes, uh, you have the power now to decide. But when you make your decision, part of this presentation is to remind you that there is a God who is involved in this world. That we are not deist. That he has not walked away. And that there are consequences uh, to the things that we decide to do. And that God rules and super rules. And he judges us based on uh, our behavior. And uh, on things that we decide to do. Now I want to read to you. And uh, I just want you to bear with me for a moment here. Uh, second Kings, second Kings chapter number 24. I'm going to read right quick, quickly, read quickly through verse one through four. It says in the, in his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon came up and Jehoiakim, king of Judah became his servant and he served him three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. He turned and rebelled against him because he thought that the battle that uh, the the Babylonians were having, they were in a tough fight with Necho of Egypt. This was in 601 BC and uh, they they had taken taken great casualties and he thought it was a good time that that the Babylonians had been weakened enough to where uh, uh, Jehoiakim could rebel and, and gain a measure of independence and freedom and not have to serve him and uh, uh, be his subject. And so, and, but look at, that was a problem. That was a problem. That was a problem. Jehoiakim Garrett, he had, he made a good move, but there was one thing that he had forgotten. He had forgotten God's judgment. According to verse two, and the Lord sent against him. He sent against Jehoiakim. How many times have you read that? The Lord sent against him bands of the Chaldees and bands of the Syrians and bands of the Moabites, the Moabites, and bands of the children of Ammon and sent them against Judah. God sent these raiders, these armies, uh, these militias, these wicked people. God sent them against his Judah. Jehoiakim had made a wise move. Now is a good time uh, to uh, make to make this move. Uh, Nico and uh, of Egypt had uh, had seriously weakened uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. He's distracted. He, he's in this battle, uh, uh, and so now I can make this move. But God sent others to ally with Nebuchadnezzar with the Babylonians to keep Judah, his Judah, subjugated, to keep Judah under the control of Nebuchadnezzar, who was an enemy nation, whose God was not the Lord. Now the question is, why did God do this? And I know I have your attention now. Let me tell you where I'm reading from again, just in case you weren't paying attention when I first told you. Second Kings chapter number 24, verse seven says that God did it now. It tells why. And he sent them against Judah. Here's what, here's what God's intention was to destroy it. According to the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servants, the prophets, God had prophesied through prophets like Jeremiah and others. As a matter of fact, the Lord has spoken some 140 years before it came to pass that Judah would fall, that Judah would fall. God raised up the prophet Jeremiah and said, not only would they fall, but Jeremiah said you will be in a fallen state and go into exile for 70 years. Why did the Lord do this? Why would God do this to his people? to the place where the mighty temple of Solomon 
was standing. Judah, the southern kingdom. Judah. You know, we're told often that Judah means praise. All right, Judah. And we see clearly here in the Bible, verse 2 says, And the Lord sent bands of Chaldeans, Syrians, Moabites, and uh, of the children of Ammon. God stirred up these nations, nations led by wicked kings who were serving demons and devils, wicked kings who didn't even know who Yahweh uh, is. Praise God. The wicked kings who didn't have the law. They weren't born again. They didn't have the Pentateuch. They didn't have the teachings of Moses. Wicked kings who knew nothing about God, but yet, because we serve a God who is in charge, they were yet in his hands. And my friends, God stirred them up, sent them against Judah. Verse 3 of, of 2 Kings chapter number 24 says, Surely at the commandment of the Lord came this upon Judah to remove them out of his sight, to cause them to be removed out of his sight, Brother Garrett, to remove them from Jerusalem, to remove them from Zion, to remove them from the temple, <clears throat> to remove them from the place where God has placed his name. The first place God had, had his name was uh, in Shiloh. Then he went from Shiloh to Gilgal. And now from Gilgal to Jerusalem. This is the place where God had placed his name. The place where, where Solomon prayed and said, God, if we just pray uh, uh, toward this temple, if you would just put your name here. Oh, my if you send locusts to devour the land, if you send pestilence, if you send drought, if we pray, if your people that are called by your name, if we would just pray that you would hear us from this place and that you would hear and help. God said, according to the writer, according to the word of the Lord, and I believe it with everything in me, God raised up these nations and sent them against Judah to remove them out of his sight and then he tells why. Now listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. If you're reading along, you see it. He says, for the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he did. Now let's, let's, let's zero in on it a little bit further. It says in verse 4, and also for the innocent blood that he shed. For he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, which the Lord would not pardon. This is Bible, my friends. This is not Republican. This is not Democrat. This is not Independence. This is Bible. And if you go to First Kings, I mean, not First Kings, Second Kings, chapter number twenty-one. My time is running out. I wanted to read uh, about all the, the sins that he did. I mean, the man built altars in the house of God. He went in Solomon's temple and built altars to other gods in Solomon's temple. You talking about uh, diversity. You talking about inclusion. You, you talking about the sins of 2024. He built altars to other gods in the house of the Lord. The Bible says uh, that uh, uh, he built altars uh, to even to the, the host of heavens. He built altars to the Zodiac. He built altars to all of these strange gods and brought these strange religions and mixed them with their Christianity. Pretty much like what we see today. All these strange religions. We used to serve the divine one. Now we got the divine nine. All these things in the house of God. And then it says in verse six, and he made his sons to pass through the fire and observe the times, made them sorcerers and use enchantments and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. 
He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord, and he did it to provoke the Lord to anger. I got to close. But verse 16 says this. Moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much until he had filled Jerusalem from one end to the other. How did he shed this innocent blood? He brought in, he brought in the worship of the Canaanite, heathenistic, bloodthirsty for innocent blood, that God, Molech. That religion, Molech, the killing of innocent victims, children being offered on the altar of Molech because Molech was considered to be the God of convenience. And if you take a child out of your family and walk that child down the trough of fire to Molech, the kid is burning, the kid is screaming and hollering. And what they did to drown out the screams and the hollers of the child is that they played drums. They played their music real loud. Boom, boom, boom. This is in Jerusalem. This is in Judah. This is in Judah. This is, this is, this is, this is the, he's got an altar in Solomon's temple. This is a part of the new organized religion. This is the diversity, the inclusion. Ninety-eight percent of all abortions today is because the child is an inconvenience. And today, as I sit before you, there are those who in every speech now includes woman, women, they lie to you, women's reproductive health, woman's uh, right to choose what to do with her own body. Uh, there are a multitude of laws already on the books that tell you what you can and can't do with your own body. You can't put cocaine in it. You can't put meth in it. Go, go and walk down the street, go in front of the police officer and do your meth and just do it in your own body and see what happens to you. There's a multitude of things that you can't do with your own body. We're governed. Thank God for that. But I, I, to this point, I'm making to you. Did you ever believe that there would be people who would include in their speech, I want to protect the right to kill, to shed innocent blood. And we'll dress it up. We won't call it what it is. We won't use the word abortion. That's the word our enemies. That's the word those who oppose us use. We'll use um, more euphemistic terms. Women's reproductive health. A woman's right to choose what to do with her own body. Uh, women's health issues. You know, things like that. When everybody knows that there's no reproduction in abortion. None whatsoever. And yet today, we're treating it like uh, it's a light thing. Well, my friends... As I bring this to a conclusion, you can tell I'm a preacher. This is my third closing. It was that sin. This was a sin that, that, that the writer said in 2 Kings chapter 24 and verse 4, the last clause, which the Lord would not pardon. We are dilly dallying and playing with, we are making nice with, such matters, such weightier matters, we are making nice with matters of such weight that these are nation killers. They are, they, they are economy destroyers. These are things that cause nations to implode. Do you still believe that righteousness exalteth a nation? Do you still believe that sin is a reproach to any people? Well, if that be the case, then you certainly must believe that this shedding of innocent blood. Science has already proved, for those of you who say trust the science, I've never seen so many people trust the science, but they don't trust it in this. Science has proven, biology has proven, everybody, the, the medical community has proven that women get pregnant with people, with children, with children, with human beings. And every child in the womb, regardless of how he got there, 
how the child got there. Every child in the womb is innocent. And we are quick to shed innocent blood. We need to pray about this. We need to take another look at it. Study the scriptures. See if I'm right. See if I have properly exegeted the text. Study it for yourself. And then I pray that you'll come to the same conclusion that I have come to. Our nation is in trouble. And I believe that God is sending messages just like this. Because hopefully and prayerfully, we have not reached a tipping point where it's too late. Now enough for my Bible study tonight. I've gave, given you a sermon. And some of you I've made shouting glad and others I've made fighting mad. Some of you are saying, oh my Lord, I can't wait to vote for him in November to put him on the general board. Others are saying, I wouldn't vote for him to save his life. Whatever, the Bible is right. Glory to God. And when I stand before the God of the Bible, I want to be able to say to him, Lord, I preached the truth and I preached it in season and out of season. Glory to God. And if I can tell him that, then I'm going to be satisfied. Now, all of that, I said all of that <laughs> to do something that uh, I'm excited about doing. Tonight, I will not be at the upper room. I'll be out this Thursday night, but I'll be back the Lord willing Sunday. And the next Thursday night, I look forward. To, uh, Brother Gary, I think I'll be in place. Praise the Lord. You know, we're, uh, I'm at the, uh, the Bishop's Conference in uh, uh, Detroit, Michigan. And uh, so, I, but listen, we're going to have a powerful, powerful service tonight. The word of God is going to go forth with power and authority. And I want you to tune in. Now, keep Brother Wood lifted in your prayers. Keep praying for me. Call my whole name. Patrick Lane Wooden. Uh, there's a junior out there. Pray for him too. But I am Patrick Lane Wooden Senior. That's Wooden with a D. Pray for me. Ask God to keep me tell, ask God to keep me strong and tell God to keep me on the wall. I have no intentions on coming down, but I am not one of those preachers who are overconfident. You say to them, man, stay with the Lord. Their response to you is, of course, I got this. Well, that's not my response. My response is pray for me. The Bible says, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. I think every one of us need prayer. I think every one of us need a word of encouragement. I think every one of us need to have some folk bombard in heaven calling our names. Call my name. Call my name. Ask God to keep me. Ask God to give me strength. And if you do that, what you pray that God do for me, the Lord will make happen for you. And just know that I'm praying for you. We'll see you the Lord willing Sunday right here at the Upper Room Church of God in Christ.